Well, let me quote a fellow's firsthand view of it. He lived here when he was 17 years old, and that was in the early 1900s. I talked to him and uh, asked him about Cripple Creek. Well, he said, my father was a mining engineer. We lived in mining centers all over the world, South Africa, Australia, big mining centers all over the world. And we never saw any place that was as busy as Cripple Creek was. He said, it was so busy that there would be a crowded sidewalk and there would be three or four rows of people that couldn't, there wasn't room for on the sidewalk on each side of the street. And he said it was the same. And, and not only that, yesterday. Cripple Creek is one of the worst diseases you'll ever have. <laughs> <laughs> Once you're here, you'll never want to leave. And like we have a business in New Mexico in maybe 10 days, and I just can't wait to get to Cripple Creek. What's there to do here in Cripple Creek? But I just love it. I just love it. Cripple Creek. I don't think so. 24 hours, a, really? you know, 24 hours a day. The mines worked all the time. The streetcars ran most of the time. Trains were coming in and out of Cripple Creek at all hours. Um, it was just always busy. Byers Avenue was busy all night long, of course. There were always uh, shows at the Grand Opera House and at the uh, Lyric Opera House. The way we feel about these days, the de Depression was the good old days to us because of the town. Uh, there's so many things we could do in those days you can't do now. Mm -hmm. You could go hunting, you go fishing, you you, uh, you could go play around the mines, or you weren't restricted. Uh, if I it was, remember if they thought we prior to gaming that uh, things were dead in Crip Creek. In February, for example, you could, I could go out there on Bennett uh, at nine o'clock at night and I could have thrown a bowling ball, bowling ball down Bennett, and uh, you wouldn't have hit anybody <laughs> or, or a vehicle or nothing. I mean, uh, it, uh, it was pretty. And there was advertising for bricklayers in Texas after Cripple Creek burnt, and so they'd saved up a thousand dollars, and they said, "Well, let's head for Cripple Creek," and so they boarded the train and the family and all of them. My dad said he can remember them old guys shooting the buffalo out of the window of the train. And he said they had all whiskers and long coats and said they're just a haw haw and just leave. And gold miners in my day, they were not working for wages. They were working for a grub stake so that they could go out and do their own prospecting and hunt for that pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Hot bed of being fleeced on everything. You know, the. It's, it's true, it's, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> flim flam things. Actually, in the, in the world that we live in, we're invented in mining towns. It's some slick guy with a briefcase trying to sell you something that's a golden dream. And I think that's why you know gambling fits into Cripple Creek because when you get up in the morning and you're in business in Cripple Creek, you're gambling on something. Whether anybody's gonna come through your door, whether the weather's gonna uh, screw you up, whether the wind's gonna blow you away or something, it's mining town philosophy and it's gambling. For more than 100 years, the Cripple Creek Mining District has nourished the dreams of thousands of men and women. Although the lure of gold is what started Cripple Creek, the dream has evolved and has meant many different things to the people who have fallen in love with the district. For some, it is a thrill of gambling. 
For some, it is the place where they grew up. For some, it is the scenic splendor of Cripple Creek's Rocky Mountain setting. And for others, it is the extraordinary history. A history as colorful and as magical as any story told about the glory days of the American West. This is a story about the people who have fallen in love with the Cripple Creek Mining District. Until 1949, life in Cribble Creek revolved around train service in and out of the district. In 1929, 18-year-old Colorado City resident Ira Current bought one of the first 16-millimeter cameras. With his hand-crank silent camera, Ira Current decided to capture history. His film is now one of the most remarkable motion picture archives of the mining district. A lifetime photographer now in his 90s, Ira Current talked about his amazing day on the Midland. Tell us about the day you went up to Cripple Creek. Why did you decide to do this film? And uh... Oh, I just figured it ought to be done. <laughs> be a nice trip, yeah. And uh, I just wanted to make it, make a picture of it. Shot a, another series, uh, you've got that too, I guess, of the freight train going up you pass. What do you remember from that day? You had the tripod, the camera, and, and one That's thing right. that I always was impressed by your films is your camera angles. You're always looking for something different, mounting at different locations. Well, and What do you well, remember that, from that day? Well, first, with that camera, the finders are very nice to use. I mean, it had one on top and one in back, so you could actually see what you're doing very well. The trouble of uh, maybe shooting out of the side of the train, of the side of the train going around curves is getting the camera mounted on the tripod. And I had to lean the tripod over the edge of the uh, observation car of the train and then uh, tilt the head and turn the camera sideways so that it would be square and then do my cranking there without knocking it over, or having it fall off or something like that. And how much was it to take the Midland at that time to Cripple Creek? Well, remember? I think it was under five bucks. I, I think, I believe it was maybe two and a half, but I may be wrong. Was it still a pretty wild town, or was it? Uh... It was uh, sort of dying down after the, uh, the gold sort of petered out. Uh, but there was, as you saw in that picture, an old prospector. I wanted to be wanted to be set up earlier to get him walking towards the the uh, camera, but I only got him as he came around the corner and put his pickaxe down. I thought that was kind of nice. <laughs> In 1966, veteran television producer Bob Fitzmorris took a primitive 16-millimeter optical camera to Cripple Creek and interviewed some of the people who helped make the district famous. Cripple Creek's Mayor Bill Robinson, international journalist Lowell Thomas, historians Marshall Sprague and Mabel Barbie Lee sat down at the Imperial Hotel to talk about their experiences and love for the mining district. The new life of Cripple Creek, Bill Robinson, who is not one of the old timers here, although I think Bill knows probably just as much about the district as anybody who's lived here for a long time. Bill came here originally as publisher of the Cripple Creek Gold Rush, and Bill, I understand your son is now publisher of the paper. That's right. You've been here since what was it, 1960? 1960, Mark. What brought you out to Cripple Creek? Oh, desire to live in an old time mining camp, I guess. 
And like so many people, you had relatives that lived here at one time. That's true, back in the 90s. When your grandfather came here? Yes, sir. My grandfather's in the livery business in Cripple Creek in the 90s. So not everybody was in the mining business in this area. Well, as I mentioned, you're kind of the, the new life of Cripple Creek. Uh, it's often thought of as a ghost town, an old mining town with nothing left. But there is a new life, as we mentioned, and this is tourism. What do you think of it? I think right at the moment, as long as the government has their unrealistic approach to gold mining, that tourism is the only hope for Cripple Creek. This is an old mining town, but as you mentioned, we have plenty of life. I think a person could spend his entire vacation in the Cripple Creek Mining District and find plenty to do. What I would consider one of the most entertaining and factual uh, historical accounts of the Cripple Creek District coming right from the time when they first ran cattle up in here right up to the present time. It's called Money Mountain, the author of which is Marshall Sprague. Marshall, uh, I uh, unfortunately just finished the book. I say unfortunately because uh, many other people have read it before I ever got to it, and it certainly is a, a very interesting book. How long does it take to research a book such as Money Mountain? I think I took about uh, two years uh, on that job. Uh, it was the first book of this region that I'd written, and I was pretty much in the dark about how it should be planned and so on. And so I got up there in, in the Colorado College Library and read the Gazette. I would practically a rewrite of the Gazette through the years that uh, Cripple Creek uh, was booming uh, at its highest. What prompted you to do a book on Cripple well, Creek in the district? And it just seemed to me that people were so interested in this fantastic uh, gold camp, which is uh, quite... Uh, uh, almost in a class by itself in world, the history of world gold rushes because it was so small and so much gold came out of such a small area. This young lady is well known for a couple of reasons. She's uh, one of the foremost authors concerning the Cripple Creek Mining District, and she was also Lowell Thomas's school teacher way back when. Mabel Barbie Lee. And Mrs. Lee, what, uh, what grades did you teach Lowell Thomas? I taught, uh, taught him or tried to teach him history and Spanish. He knew much more history than I did. And uh, I was always very much afraid he was going to ask me a question I couldn't answer. <laughs> <laughs> this would have been somewhat embarrassing. But I knew more Spanish than he did. And even today I notice now that when he speaks of it, he says that he studied Spanish with me. He doesn't say he studied history with me, and there's a good reason. <laughs> Why? <laughs> he's, he's been studying history ever since, yes. hasn't he? Well, he, his father was a very brilliant scholar, and I think Lowell studied uh, with his father a great deal at home, and it put him ahead in school, you see, and handicapped poor little school teachers like me. <laughs> Probably one of the most well-known exponents of the Cripple Creek Mining District, a man who grew up in the mining district and lived a good portion of his life over in Victor and uh, actually got a start in the journalism business in Victor. That's Mr. Lowell Thomas. And Lowell, uh, you've always been one that's uh, been quite a plugger of the Cripple Creek Mining District, have you not? Well, I'm an enthusiast for um, all mining camps, but of course, particularly for my own hometown. Because when I was a boy, uh, the Cripple Creek District was regarded as the greatest gold camp in the world. I imagine its only rival uh, in those days was uh, the great camp at Johannesburg on the Transvaal. But uh, these mines here, they're all around us. We're sitting in the Imperial Hotel in Cripple Creek at the moment. And I come back to the Cripple Creek District, to Victor, and to its suburb, Cripple Creek, as often as I can, every two or three years. And this time, I'm here, uh, oh, sort of playing host to a group of people who've been getting together every summer for all oh, 50 years or so because the people who worked in the mines here in the Cripple Creek District they seem to almost belong to a club and they enjoy coming back and trying to relive the old days alas alas so far I've been up here for two hours this morning already and so far I haven't met a single one hard rack who goes back to the days uh, when I was here None of my vintage, so you see, I've become a patriarch. <laughs> At any rate, it's, it's great fun to come back and to come to the Imperial Hotel, uh, the home of melodrama, where the first Western melodrama was put on, that is, in what we call modern times, this jet age. 
And so long until tomorrow. Maybe the most hazardous work during any era in this country was working underground as a hard rock miner. It took a special person to risk their life in search of precious metals. Although the boom time was over by the end of the first decade of the 20th century, there are still a handful of hard rock miners who can tell the tale of life underground. I did know quite a few um, beyond those that I've named. And uh, first of all, I'd say they were all gentlemen. They all had families. Uh, their kids all went through school. Uh, a lot of them uh, were uh, church members, lodge members. They lived in Cripple Creek uh, just about the same way that we live in Colorado Springs. They had their, their family was very important to them, their church, their lodge, the school. Uh, there were opera houses, you know, they. They were filled up night after night with miners and their families seeing grand opera. That doesn't exactly mesh with what we normally think of as a miner, but they were doing it. Uh, there were also uh, quite a few of them down on Myers Avenue hooping it up with the girls and, and heisting a few. There was no shortage of whorehouses or bars on Myers Avenue. So there was that element too. Well, they were just ordinary people of the time. Um, they were sincere, they were honest, um, they were in charge of their lives, their work, and uh, they did whatever they had to do to get by, but uh, I don't think they're much different than people today, only that they were faced with a more serious side of life because of their occupation. Well, he's a guy that doesn't pity himself. He's more intrigued with a challenge than he is of being comfortable and uh, they'll try almost anything. They like to uh, see who's the strongest, you know, and who's the toughest, and so they compete with each other. You know how men are when they get together. They always are competing, showing who is the, who is the one that stands out. Well, the main, main one I remember is Freddie Clegg. He was a blacksmith over to Crescent for a good many years, and this after he retired, I was walking down the street one morning and I met his wife and she had a bloody spot on her forehead. And I said, Marie, what happened to you? She says, well, I'm pretty mad at that, Freddie. We've been married X number of years, I don't remember. And he said, she says, you know he never hit me over the head with an ax before. <laughs> well, my introduction to the hard rock miners was my first night in the cottage gym when I bought the bar. And coming from the school teaching profession, it was an entirely different environment. The right. uh, first night I was there, the, they, I guess they were going to try me out. The miners got to arguing about where, where the biggest, richest load. They knew where the mother load was. First thing I know, there was about five of them getting ready. They, they took all their false teeth out and put it on top of the bar and went outside and fought it out. <laughs> they didn't want to bust up their false teeth. <laughs> Just like you or me, some of them liked that kind of work, some of them didn't, and uh, it was hard work, but back in those days, farming or anything else was the same way, hard work. And guys would drift into here and they'd get hired by the mines, they'd uh, work underground, and there was top jobs too, you could work in the ore house. So just ordinary people like today, those guys that are working over at the mill today could be the same kind. They were, a lot of them were hard drinkers and they partied around a lot. Yeah, I got married and divorced like everybody else. <laughs> One time we had this, his name was Harry Dewhurst. He's long gone, but bless his heart. He was just a little old miner that just was kind of ornery. And one time he came into the bar and he says, he ordered this drink. He always, it was a kokai, which is bourbon and coke, you know. And he says, Lodi, give me a kokai. And I says, okay. And at that time, when we first came here, we only had drinks. Beer was like 
25 cents and maybe 40 cents for a mixed drink. He says, I don't have 40 cents. Here's a pair of pliers. <laughs> so I said, okay, I'll just take them. It's the best little pair of pliers I ever had. They were just <laughs> just loved them. They were worth the word. <laughs> and then, yes, they were. And it wasn't long until you wanted those pliers back. And I said, sorry, Harry. <laughs> They're mine. <laughs> well, I've said often, and I still think it applies, it isn't so much an occupation as it is an adventure. You always have something unexpected. You always have, well, you have both kinds, good things and bad things that are unexpected. It ke keeps you on your toes all the time. Actually, you look back, it was pretty tough, but then we didn't consider that tough. That was our living. We ne never thought about that. As far as going into a mine, it, we never thought of that. Actually, in this first mine that I was telling you about, we worked. It would scare you people if you ever saw it. There was a big stope, went down from three to 800, big stope. We built a railroad track around that with steel in the sidewalls so we'd get around to our, our uh, level where we were and we'd bring these tram cars around and take them out to the shaft to dump them. But you would straddle the track pushing the tram cars and there was still that many feet underneath of you, but you didn't see it. So you never thought of it. Mm -hmm. Really, it didn't like bother you. A stove was like a well, I got caught in the belt of a crusher that was running four years ago. And it picked me up and pitched me head first into a steel frame. And uh, it was uh, a little upsetting. I was almost standing on my head, and I couldn't get out for a while. When I got out, I found out my scalp had been peeled clear off my skull and was hanging down my neck, and uh, I was passing out. felt like I was passing out very fast. So I climbed down off the crusher and laid down on the ground with my head downhill so it would help me help my circulation. And when I came to, I couldn't get up, so I crawled on my hands and knees and went over to shut off the engine that was driving the crusher. And then I went over to the generator and shut it off. And then I went over to my car and uh, drove myself into the clinic in Cripple Creek. Uh, the, mind, the mind is something that, that isn't dangerous unless you get careless. And there is, there is when the, we got a southeast uh, breeze rolling around, there's a, there's a dioxide gas that blows in. In other words, it, it blows out all your oxygen and, and they have that. And uh, I've worked on the crest in there on 1000 uh, several times when, when you light a match or anything and throw it on the ground, just go right out. And, uh, but the, the, if you know what you're doing in the gas, it isn't too bad, but uh, Johnny Stark lost his life on the crescent for the same reason from gas, and he knew it was there, and he was one of the bosses. He went back through that that uh, the gas door there on 1000, and he didn't he didn't get 10 feet back in there, and down he went. And the guys all spooked out, and they wouldn't go get him. But uh, I was down on I think 17 or 21 someplace that at that time. And uh, I would like to go back into mining again. If there's an underground mine operating in the near future, I, I hope to get another job. Actually, this hard rock mining, uh, it was a disease. If you ever started it, you actually never got over it. Right now, I'm not over it. If, if I were young enough, go back, I, I think it's the idea that you might make a million. And it's gambling. It's the same thing as you got right here. Cripple crack, it's just gambling. And you think, and the next day, you couldn't wait to get back the next day to see what your round did if you hit it. There used to be a man over in Victor, had a mine up the hill from Victor, which is pretty steep. He would walk about a mile and a half to work every morning to go to work, and he mined by himself. He was 90 years old, and he walked that steep hill and mined all day long, and he did that daily at 90 years of age. So I've got a role model.
Wayne and Dorothy Mackin purchased the Imperial Hotel in 1947 and went on to make history in the mining district. Wayne Mackin, a former officer in the famed 10th Mountain Division, was a combat veteran who had participated in some of the fiercest battles in Italy. It was the veterans of the 10th Mountain Division who started the ski industry in Colorado. His wife, Dorothy, was a self-taught businesswoman, and they both had banked on the mines reopening in Cripple Creek after the war to make their Imperial Hotel a success. When the price of gold and other factors kept the mines from reopening, Wayne and Dorothy had to figure out a way to stay in business. It was a matter of survival, and these two resourceful people created the modern revival of the melodrama in Cripple Creek. The Imperial Hotel melodrama also helped create a tourist industry in the district. As a result of their hard work and vision, they were able to save the business and also save the city of Cripple Creek from becoming just another mining ghost town. The Mackins had three children named Stephen, Susan, and Jeffrey, and they all started working at the hotel at a very young age. When gambling began in Cripple Creek in 1992, the Mackins sold their hotel, but still managed the melodrama until Dorothy's death in 1996. Their oldest son, Steve Mackin, and his wife, Bonnie, currently own and operate the Hospitality House, a popular bed and breakfast in the northwest side of town. After a five-year hiatus, Steve Mackin brought back the melodrama to Cripple Creek in the newly built Butte Opera House. They actually met at the tavern in the Broadmoor in uh, probably January or February of 1946. Wayne was the commanding officer for the 10th Mountain Division at Camp Carson. And Dorothy was there with her mother, uh, kind of on the, uh, at the end of a divorce. And she'd had a fruit brokerage business in Denver that she just sold. And Wayne was just partying with his friends. And they met and uh, made a, an appointment to play ping pong the next morning. And uh, neither one of them thought either one of them would show up, and they both did. And uh, they were together after that. They got married in March of uh, 46 and were looking for a place to do something. Here we had an old Studebaker. We drove to Cripple Creek on our own. We didn't want to see what Cripple Creek was like. Right. And uh, when we hit the top of Tenderfoot Hill looking down into Cripple Creek, well, I thought, Brigham Young, uh, this is it. This was strictly a mining town when I came here, except for the notable exception of the Imperial Hotel, which had been open two or three years. And uh, then they started the melodrama in about 1949, and it started drawing tourists to town. And in those days, of course, the hotel stayed open year-round, and it created business. And then a tourist street built up, and uh, tourist shops opened, and over a period of time, it became really quite promising. Mm. And the Mackins made a lot of money and spent a lot. And they're still spending a lot. And then the people you grow up with, I mean, all of the actors and actresses and, you know, 40 to 70 employees every summer that were coming from all over the world. It was a real diverse education. Craig T. Nelson, who was in coach for a long time, he worked with this. Ronnie Claire Edwards, who was uh, the aunt on the Waltons for the full run of that. She kind of stands out as people I know. Max Morath, who was you know, a wonderful person. And this reunion we had, you know, in April was 50 years that he had been started yeah, with, my, with my parents. And it was a grand deal. Dorothy had been in the food business. Uh, this was a woman way ahead of her times. She was in the wholesale food business in Denver. And Wayne, of course, had been impaired in the uh, ski troopers, you know, Mountain Cold Weather Training Command up at Leadville. They got together and bought this funny old hotel. And uh, with the sweat of their brow, and Wayne's one of these guys, he can fix anything. Carpentry, plumbing, electric, you know. One of the uh, most uh, 
totally uh, effective, gentle people I've ever known. Dorothy Mackin is, was, the late Dorothy Mackin, a terrific businesswoman, great with people, managing those casts, all those kids coming in every season, turning over. She was tough. She was tough. They got the job done. I was a young man, oh, 14, 15 years old, working part-time at the Blue Front grocery store, and uh, Mams Mackin, they called Dorothy Mams, uh, she was in charge of the kitchen in the early days at, at the hotel. And when you made a delivery to the kitchen, she wanted to be there, and she insisted on being there, to look at every head of lettuce and every cut of meat and everything that went in there. And if it wasn't right, you took it back to the grocery store and brought back what was right. So I learned early on about Dorothy Mackin. Well, there was only one Dorothy Mackin. She was a very unique person. She had a tremendous drive. <clears throat> very, very nice person to work with. I, uh, I knew Dorothy in several ways. Uh, one was in the printing business. Um, she was good enough to let me do all the printing for the hotel. It was a very good account. And she was extremely nice to work with. And uh, then a real friendship developed. I had a great fondness for her. And, uh, after they retired from the Imperial, um, they traveled a good deal, and uh, Dorothy would send postcards back from all over the world. And, um, and then when she would be settled in Tucson or Mexico with Wayne during the winter, uh, she would correspond with me. She was a great letter writer. Uh, she was a great reader. She was always sending me books and books that she recommended. So we developed a very nice friendship. And uh, I, uh, she'd been gone now for a few years, but I still miss her very much. It, it was a boom for Cripple Creek uh, because you knew the tourist season was here when the hotel opened. And there would be people that you hadn't seen. <laughs> all winter you know you don't see anybody but the people you know and then and that was the beginning in the tourist era in Cripple Creek. Everybody thought that they left after they closed up and went to Tucson uh, just to winter in Arizona well Wayne <laughs> Wayne went down there and tended bar in the winter time you know and I'm not sure that Dorothy didn't she was either going for the next uh, melodrama play putting that together or maybe she worked. I don't know, but they both worked hard. And then they had all the little kids growing up, you know, so. Uh, yeah, you're an overnight success after you work about 40 years at something, you know. <laughs> I think, you know, I'm real biased about it, but I think they're totally responsible. Because when they started doing things, other people came in and said, well, they, they're making it work so you know, I'll have a chance here in the summer. And people would say, you know, they could know the, the absolute minute that the show opened and the minute the show closed because their business was totally affected by that. And um, the rebirth of the tourism trade happened because of that. People would come up to see the show and then the Molly Kathleen mine would reopen to, to uh, take people down the, and do the tourist stuff. And the museum, basically was only open during the time that the show was open. And I mean, they closed all winter long. And the Homestead Museum was the same thing. And everything kind of revolved around the, the theater season. So you had 13, 12 to 13 weeks for the summer to make your money, and you lived on it all winter. And it happened. Yeah. I mean, it was a viable way to live. We had a, a real disaster in 1950. We were we thought we were such hot shots that we took a play to Phoenix and we got in with a bad character, actually, a nice uh, plant, but uh, we weren't able to run the operation. That is, we could only run the play. He ran the dining room, the reservations, and so forth. Well, it, it wasn't well taken care of. So anyway, we were in a real melodrama. We, we had to close the play. We'd lost money. 
our daughter, two years old, broke her leg, falling off the porch of the house we rented. Uh, we came back to save the mortgage on the hotel. Uh, Dorothy had a appendix operation. Uh, we were nobody would look at us or loan us money, and they were going to be foreclosed on. The uh, one party that I went to see about getting a loan to take over the mortgage was the Stratton home. And uh, we, we had a, a couple that came to all of our plays and so forth and loved us and said, uh, we're, we're, you, we'll meet with the board and see what we can do. And I meet, go to the board, and Dorothy's sitting in the car with her, just out of the hospital with her appendix operation. And they said, we will loan you the money. We, we will also, we think you should have a little more money than what you're asking for to be sure to get back into operation. Uh, I gladly accepted that. And uh, from then on, that business really took off. You know, it seems so funny now that here I'm talking to you, and uh, 50 years ago, I was talking to the old timers to see more and learn more about Cripple Creek and all. And now, what, 50, 46 to 98? I'm one of the old timers. It's been interesting. I've, I've had so many of my Tenth Mountain friends that, say, uh, and you read about them too. That uh, after going through that training and that war and all, that they could, felt like they could do anything. And uh, and I, I I think that is something that happens. I, uh, and here, so many of us left our home area and struck out on our own and uh, did it some way or another. Here you come into a new area. I knew two people, I think, in Colorado Springs when I came here. And, uh, and to be able to make friends like we did, it, it's just really wonderful mm -hmm. that, that they would accept us and accept us uh, the way they did. At the turn of the 19th century, Cripple Creek was the last of the wild western towns. Gamblers, prostitutes, con men, union organizers, gold miners, land speculators all found their way to Cripple Creek. Some people think that Cripple Creek still attracts those types of people, and things really haven't changed that much in over a hundred years. Now what about in Cripple Creek? You said there, there were still some girls working over in Cripple Creek. Well, it was on the uh, Bennett Avenue, the street below Bennett Avenue. Myers, Myers Avenue. There's still a, the, the house is still there where it was very prominent, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, the old homestead. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I remember, yes, I remember when I was a pretty young boy on that. They were still going up there strong. Yeah. Did you ever see any of the ladies? No, I was a little young. They wouldn't let me in then. Yeah. <laughs> did you try and get in? <laughs> <laughs> Probably did. A bunch of us would go up at a time, you know. Yeah. Try to raise a little hell. Yeah, you, meant, you, touched, you mentioned the prostitution that was going on when you first got there. Well, there was two of them in Cripple Creek, one in Victor. Yeah. Did you know any of the girls? Why, sure. Yeah. Hell, a young buck, I visited them all. <laughs> Did you really? Good for you. <laughs> my mother, when we were on the homestead, we came in, my, my grandmother lived over on uh, uh, Irene Street, which is across to the south end of town. We had to go up Myers Avenue partway and go across a bridge to go over to there, where the cribs were down the way. We had to go by the cribs, and I remember those 
we went by and I looked up and the lady women were sitting in the windows. They waved at me. I thought, they are the greatest people. Uh, really, they were nice. And they waved at me and oh, my mother all of a sudden grabbed my arm. She, boy, up the street we went. My mother was quite straight laced. Up the street we went and that's the last time we went by the cribs. Employment was not really the greatest and they were looking for men to marry. And so they would go to work in these kind of houses, hoping to meet somebody. Well, to work at the homestead was really, really exceptional because they were gonna meet high-class men with money. And it was very, very common for prostitutes to start out working like this and then marry. Sometimes women would die very young in childbirth and leave a family. And a man needed a woman to come in and take care of his family, and they would marry these prostitutes. And very seldom did they ever work under their real name. They took an assumed name. So if they had a chance to marry, they could go back to their real name and nobody would ever be able to trace them. I think if you were a Pearl Devere, life was pretty good. Uh, I mean, she wore the best of clothes and she drank the best of champagnes and she lived in a beautiful house and uh, she had all kinds of money. So uh, uh, on the surface, it would seem that life was pretty good. Yet she killed herself, apparently. We never knew whether it was an accident or not, but uh, it very likely was suicide. And there were a lot of suicides. So uh, I don't think the girls on the road were terribly happy. Uh, it was my mom's story that when they buried Pearl Devere, everybody went and said, goodbye, little girl, goodbye. And coming back said, there'll be a hot time in the old town tonight. Uh, and my mother had gone into the mortuary to see her as she was laid out. And she always talked about her being the flowing red hair laying on this white couch. And my mother thought that was quite a story she never has forgotten because Pearl de Vere was Pearl de Vere, you know. I remember uh, one little fellow, his first name was Mike, I can't recall right now what his last name was, uh, grew up in the uh, edges of the red light district. And when he was just a little boy, he ran errands for the girls on the row and uh, they had a system worked out where uh, this isn't right, but it's, it's coming close. An ace of diamonds would mean something. A jack of spades would mean something. And he would take this card to the druggist. And the druggist would send an ounce of opium or whatever uh, back to uh, the uh, woman with his little boy. Uh, they understood what this card meant. Uh, and this little boy was always tipped very handsomely. Well, my grandmother used to say, talk about Myers Avenue, and she said it was quite a street. It was off limits to the young kids. They didn't want young kids going down there. But the, the guys that I talked to, one kid just left here, uh, he said he used to carry their coal and wood in in some of them parlor houses. And he said them, them women treated them like kings because they couldn't get anybody to, And he said his mother found out where he's getting that money and she said, oh, I, I don't want you kids going up there anymore. And she wanted him to quit, but they kept on working because it was their candy money. And then when Myers Avenue petered out into uh, Poverty Gulch, there, was a, there were quite a few nationalities up there. There were Orientals up there. There were a lot of Hispanics up there. And there were a lot of black women up there. It was kind of an international settlement. These were one-woman cribs. But, uh, they, they ran right up and under the uh, tracks that brought people into town. And uh, there was quite a to-do over that. Uh, some of the girls were very anxious, and they started soliciting. <laughs> <laughs> from 
under the trains as the trains were pulling slowly into the Cripple Creek Station. They had the first crack at the passengers. <laughs> well, Granddad, uh, he uh, he used to tell some pretty good stories. Uh, when they lived uh, in the early days, when they lived up on Silver Street, well, the Gold King Mine, where gold was discovered, was just right over the hill from there, and they lived, well, within a quarter of a mile from the Gold King Mine, and everybody walked downtown to the opera houses and to the plays or whatever and prize fights, and one night he was walking home, and there was a guy who looked like he had been drinking. He was staggering around, but he had a big, heavy sack on his back, and uh, Granddad said, they come under a street light and he said, could I help you? And he said, no. And he just pulled out a gun and said, you just keep walking because he was one of the high graders off of the Gold King Mine. They'd go up at night and and steal the, the gold, you know, and uh, just pack it by the sack down off that hill. And I fought, I fought 21 fights there before I ever lost a, a decision. And I never had a trainer, I never had a manager. And I just, I'd just go in and fight. And they'd call me up and ask me, uh, if I if we'd come up tonight and fight somebody, not sure, <laughs> you know, and uh, uh, that's the uh, that's the reason lots of that I lost maybe the fights that I did lose, but I just uh, I didn't lose very many out of the whole bunch. But there was another lady, Myrtle Dodson. She told me about that strike. She said it was terrible. She said uh, her name was uh, Chappelle. They're related to Jim McGee and Cripple Creek. And Myrtle told me that she said her poor old mother, she said they'd come there and try to get her her dad. And she said back then they, the women wore big long dresses. And she said there was a, a trap door in the floor and she said her poor old dad would have to hide under that floor. And she said the one night the, the law come and wanted to know Mr. Well, Mr. Chappelle was. And she said, well, she never, he hadn't come home yet. And she said she had to lie to him because they'd have taken him and, and they'd have killed him, she said. And she said, Mama had stood over this trap door with that big old skirt so they couldn't see. So they couldn't see. Uh -huh. uh, my great-grandfather received a telegram that we still have from Sherman Bell that said, quell all disturbance. If you have to shoot, shoot to kill. In fact, my great-grandfather took one of the guns off of one of the gunfighters that we had for years. And my grandfather really liked that gun because it was in the first place it was beautiful, had a barrel on it like this. What kind of gun was it? It was a Colt, a silver Colt. Mm -hmm. But the trigger had been filed down so much that all you had to do was think about shooting this gun and it would go off. Finding people at the bottom of the mine shafts wasn't that unusual. Um, that was a normal way to get rid of somebody. <laughs> Although usually they'd probably use a prospect hole where nobody'd go down the bottom. And the prospect holes have been used up here probably up until about the 1950s for disposal purposes. Well, apparently a, a gentleman who was stationed at one of the military bases down in the Springs came up and wanted to check out an old mine and ignored the no trespassing signs and the dangerous mining district signs. and got up around the collar of the shaft, which would be the top of the shaft. And of course it was rotten and it caved in and down he went. And down he stayed. He's still there today. On the west side of Cripple Creek in a beautiful mountain setting is the Mount Pisgah Cemetery, which is operated by Art Trumaine. You can feel the ghost all around you when you walk through the sacred ground. Mabel Barbie Lee, Pearl DeVere, Doc Susie, and hundreds of hard rock miners are buried at this holy place in the shadow of Pikes Peak. Their noble dreams are still alive, 
in the men and women who call the Cripple Creek Mining District home. And I think that's why, you know, gambling fits into Cripple Creek because when you get up in the morning and you're in business in Cripple Creek, you're gambling on something. Whether anybody's going to come through your door, whether the weather's going to uh, screw you up, whether the wind's going to blow you away or something, it's mining town philosophy and it's gambling. And if you go to work in the mines, there's the gamble that you may not come home or there's a gamble that you're going to, and what you're staking your whole uh, thing on is that you're going to hit the main, the mother load. And that's why they're still doing it today. I mean, you see these people running around the hills between here and Victor, and they're all grinning, they're working their butt off, and they come home with calluses because there's that dream that they're going to hit it rich. And it's the same thing when you go and feed a slot machine. And it's the same thing when I open the theater every night. I'm thinking, well, tonight I'm going to fill up. They're always uh, the environmentalists. Are, I don't see how you could hurt the environment around here. <laughs> you know, they always had a joke during the war that, Nobody would ever bomb Cripple Creek come over because it looked like it had already been bombed. <laughs> so <laughs> all the all the different mining prospect holes and uh, and things like that. It, it, they we're a mining community. That's all it is to it. It's like Leadville is. You're not going to make a thing of beauty out of these mining towns. And uh, I'd rather have the prosperity of a, a good company like that. And gambling may come and go. I think the mining will be here, you know, for many years. Well, I I hope it can keep going because if we lose the mine, we're really in a mess. It employs a lot of people. Yeah. In fact, if it wasn't for that mine, Victor wouldn't even be here, I don't think. I know we wouldn't be here because this building belongs to the mine mm -hmm. and they're giving us a discount on the rent and stuff. Well, first off, it's this is home, and secondly, I I like the size of Victor. It's not too big. It sometimes may be too small, but it's peaceful. It's can, I'm content here, uh, even on the days you know when we're having a raging blizzard and the power goes out. Uh, those are sometimes the best days. You, there's a lot of things that we live with today that we really don't need to live with. And up here, you don't know whether you're going to get to live with that tomorrow or not. It might be gone because it's so rugged up here. A lot of people think it's very desolate up here. I choose to think that maybe God keeps the population down because he likes it up here. <laughs> and he's tired of the people. I think that it is time to start making Cripple Creek look like a city. And what I mean by that is we need to get our sidewalks, our curb and guttering done, our paving completed, our uh, historical lamps up, our parks done, to start making this li uh, look like a community. Um, and again, also we need to uh, look at the, some of the empty buildings here, either get their facades fixed up, uh, and hopefully get, uh, the owners of these buildings will, uh, will uh, get the insides fixed up so we can rent them out as retail space for shops and things like this. If we have shops in, in Cripple Creek, we'll uh, attract more and more people here to Cripple Creek also. The, uh, the other thing that follows, uh, you have a community, people want to come and live here. Um, I'm not saying that, you know, I don't want to see just massive growth, and I don't think Cripple Creek is going to have that either, unless a huge casino moves in or the limits are raised to whatever uh, point they may be raised. But I don't think you're going to see it. I think it will have slow growth, uh, but at the same time we need to make this look like a community. People are happy to live here. The mine depends upon uh, employees, as do the, uh, the uh, uh, casinos. Uh, they need employees that are, uh, as far as I'm concerned, are local. It makes it easier. You know that they'll be in, you know, no matter what the weather or anything. But uh, I really do, and I think it will uh, bring to uh, Cripple Creek a more, uh, greater sense of community. We're doing very well at gambling financially. We're doing very well financially on mining right now. And with the mining, when I came here, there were 26 mines working. There's one mine working now, but what they've done is mined the whole area, one company doing the whole bit. And they last year produced 375,000 ounces of gold. That's not too bad at 280. We don't have... Uh, the right kind of weather for 
certain activities. We don't have enough snow for skiing, but we have history to sell, and that sells pretty well. Uh, I hope it isn't always just a gambling town. I'd like to see it be a, a family vacation destination. I'd like to see people coming up there with their families enjoying the scenery. Because we have magnificent scenery in Cripple Creek and Teller County. I mean, Mueller Park is a beautiful park. Uh, the fossil beds, national monuments, marvelous place to hike. There's wildlife and you know, magnificent views and uh, wildflowers this time of the year. It's, it's a beautiful county. And uh, <clears throat> historically, it is so rich. And uh, the district has such good museums. The District Museum in Cripple Creek is just simply one of the best little museums in America. There's no question about it. I think bison, Lake Bison, is the thing that is the most important thing to me in this entire part of the country, really. How come? I just, it's, it's just the most beautiful place I've ever seen. And it's, you know, you know con considering that there's that little series of lakes and that beautiful watershed up there, you know, and mm -hmm. we stock all those nice fish there for people, and then we've done the cabins, you know, and it's just a pleasant place to be. Everybody talks about gold and precious metals and stuff. Bison is our liquid gold. It is the most important thing that this area has. It, it is the whole watershed, and it, water is king up here, you know. So bison is, is, is just critical.